see people starting to come in. There's Kerry from Toowoomba on Jarraweer Country. Hello. Uh, and others in the room. Fantastic. Please let us know in the chat where you are. Um, this is, of course, week eight of the NAVA Advocacy Program, and I see there are still, still people coming in. Please, as you come in, open up the, the chat. Um, let us where you are. Oh, there's Michaela from the UK again, where it is 7 a.m. as we have yeah. established before. Impressive. Hi, Michaela. Anna Stafford from Bromadero says, hello, Esther and Maria. Hi. Emily Bullock from Glebe, my old stomping ground. I spent a good few years in Glebe about 20 years ago, and it still feels very close to my heart. Um, that is super lovely. Julie from 101 Country in Armadale. Hello. Ah, Grace from Melbourne. Excited to finally join in week eight. Welcome, Grace. I am also on the lands of the Bunwarang and the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation uh, in Naram here in Melbourne, which is which is my home. Uh, Adam is also from the uh, People's Republic of Northcote, not too far from here. <laughs> Very important <laughs> part of Melbourne. Lots of Melburnians. This is great. Ah, oh, hello, Ian from Soldiers Hill. Lucy tuning in from Ghana land. Uh, great to see you again. This is one of the loveliest and I think one of the most important things of the NAVA Advocacy Program is connecting um, with each other and building these skills um, in being greater advocates together. Um, as we've discussed um, when we, um, in our first few weeks and each time as we, as we frame the NAVA Advocacy Program, this is all about how can we really build something that lasts? How can we develop great advocacy skills that aren't just, mm -hmm. you know, one-off things that we mobilise in a time of emergency or crisis as we're experiencing now? Um, how can we really build something that lasts? And particularly in the last week, uh, as we've seen some of the statements being made uh, by uh, members of government, by, by politicians about the arts and the, you know, the lack of understanding of, of really key issues in the industry, it's just so important that we are uh, fostering really well-informed, well-distributed conversations um, all across Australia. Uh, now, as you know, those of you who've joined us before, and welcome if you've not joined us, if you're just coming in, um, please let us know in the chat where you are. Uh, Larissa from Yagara Country uh, up in Ipswich, hello. Uh, Miriam Abud from Coburg North, uh, great to see you. Um, and, uh, and accordingly, it's on Wachabalak Jadwa, Jadwa Jalua Gaya and, and Japagalk country, um, which is a part of Victoria that I also miss uh, very much. Um, the NAVA Advocacy Program, each of our sessions are recorded, uh, they are transcribed, and um, as uh, Leia has posted there, the link to the live captioning, uh, say hi everyone to Leia Reid, our Advocacy and Communications Manager, who's also with us, and Helen, who is live captioning from Brisbane. So there is the link right there. It can be difficult sometimes um, uh, to keep following the audio or to even just get a good audio connection. So um, do click on the live captioning link um, if, if, if that's going to be um, of good help. Um, and Gabrielle Sullivan uh, is joining us from Wajik Nunga land in Perth, where they're waiting for the next storm to roll in. And I believe this time last week, we were also very concerned about a big storm in Perth. And hello, Ray Turner from New Zealand. Oh, uh, great to see you. Um, really fantastic. And I can see Alicia Lonsdale on the line, uh, an artist whose work I deeply appreciate. Uh, Claire Sunyas from Artisan in Queensland. Great to see you here. Um, oh, hello, Georgie Cirillo. Um, and lots of artists and colleagues from, from all over the country. So before I introduce Maria, Let's talk about where we've been uh, to get to today's point because today is, uh, as we do in every kind of four week, uh, the end of four week block, it's our um, Q&A with a politician, as we call it. So I'm just now sharing the screen. Please let me know in the chat if you're now seeing a screen with um, the front page of the Advocacy Program Handbook. I hope that you can all see that. Thanks, yes. Carolyn. Thank you. Great. Always good to just be sure. Um, 
As we know, the NADA Advocacy Program is offered uh, free for everyone uh, with thanks to the philanthropy of Daniel Beeson and the, um, the kit uh, is for NADA members. NADA members would be very shirty with me if we weren't offering something that was specifically for NADA members. It's very easy to become a NADA member. Uh, it costs just $7.50 a month at, at minimum and then you can access our world of resources and thank you to Leah for just posting the link to um, um, uh, the, um, the advocacy program handbook part two because I do uh, update it once a month. So, so far we've had a good few weeks looking at advoca advocating the arts. We looked at advocacy in a time of coronavirus setting the scene in this emergency situation. We recapped Arts Day on the Hill last year we talked about First Nations advocacy and then we reflected on all of that with our first Q&A with the politician, John Alexander, also co-chair of the Parliamentary Friendship Group for Contemporary Arts and Culture. We then, in this four-week period, we've been, we've been looking at understanding policy development. So four chapters to our program, advocating the arts, understanding policy development, understanding the media, and then understanding the politics, all getting us towards Arts Day on the Hill on Wednesday the 12th of August, so that we are best placed to have some mass um, uh, national focus on advocacy for the arts. So in this section, policy literacy, where do the arts sit? We had a great conversation with John Daly, the CEO of the Grattan Institute, to really contextualise arts policy uh, in broader national priorities at the moment. We then zoomed out globally, looked at global comparisons, who's doing this well? Um, and we were joined by Dr Jackie Bailey, a Global Cultural Policy Research and Evaluation Specialist, and you'll see in the uh, in, in the kit, we do have some information, uh, some, some research from Jackie and the team, which I'll have a look at later. Then last week, achieving policy goals from within an invisible portfolio, we were joined by Mike Murdoch AO, the former secretary of the former Department of Communications and the Arts. And this week, um, continuing our reflection back and um, and and having the great opportunity of um, of a politician, a parliamentarian, I should say, a member of parliament who has just spent all day today in <laughs> Parliament House. Um, it is my great, great pleasure to welcome Maria Van Vakino, the member for Caldwell and the co-chair of the Parliamentary Friendship Group for Contemporary Arts and Culture. Welcome, Maria. Thank you, and I'm really pleased to be here, and I, I hope I can be useful to you this afternoon in what appears to be a, a, a fantastic program that you're running and uh, a very impressive one actually to the extent that when it's all done and dusted and you've got it uh, available in its entirety I'd be very interested to try and sit through it and hear about things from all of those very important people that you've had on on um, this conversation. Oh, brilliant. And and put the team on it too, because um, as Leia has linked, I think um, uh, all of the past sessions are available. Um, in fact, with the miracle of, of this program um, and the great um, work of the NADA team, um, each of these sessions is able the very next day. And so you can you can leap right into it. The teacher uh, in me is, is very interested <laughs> in putting it into a package and using it as a way of raising awareness and educating. Well, that is exactly our plan. Um, now, Anna is saying that Maria is upside down on her screen. Uh, she's right way up on my screen, but we have had a glitch that Anna mentions before that sometimes okay. one or both of us appear upside down. But uh, I'm sorry, I can Maria. Boast about my yoga prowess, then. That's right. That's exactly right. That's what I'll do. <laughs> Now, it being a busy day at Parliament House and, and Maria does have her whips duties today, she can only join us till about quarter to five. Yeah. So Maria and I are going to have a conversation. Um, I'm going to ask her a range of, of questions. But again, this uh, session is about us reflecting on mm -hmm. the last four weeks. And so please add your questions to the chat um, and let's have a great conversation around um, uh, arts and cultural policy. Now, 
Something that uh, Maria has mentioned to me many times before um, that is um, important uh, to you, Maria, as a, a set of values is that distinction between arts policy and cultural policy. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what that means to you? Well, I, I mean, cultural policy for me is a cultural inheritance which goes to people's identity um, and their, you know, their origins uh, and practices and, and, and sets of beliefs which distinguish them. Um, arts for me is, is the creative expression that, it, that comes from those cultural inheritances and um, both are, are linked. They're very important to each other and arts for me is an expression of that cultural identity. Um, which is why, Esther, you'll be very familiar in the conversations that I've had with you, that I genuinely and passionately believe that it's time in this country for us to have a Ministry of Art and Culture. Yeah, yeah. I completely agree. I mean, it's something that when we look at what's going on right now mm -hmm. and um, um, many of you have heard me characterise the pandemic in this way. This is the, the most significant disruption to our cultural life that yes. many of us have ever, ever known. So those, um, that sense of that um, heritage of, of um, practices and, um, and, and rituals and behaviours and objects and, you know, all, all of those kinds of things, but also the way that we just go about practising our everyday mm. lives, mm. the things that are important mm. to us. Mm. Um, and in the absence of having um, an arts and cultural uh, portfolio or focus, our sense of culture just being lost at this time, hasn't it? It has been, but we're also a country that's still in the process of developing and growing and understanding and even indeed accepting its cultural inheritance because this country, as you'll be familiar, has an ancient Indigenous inheritance um, and it's a country that's a modern country built on migration waves of migrants initially from you know we the, the days of the united kingdom white settlement and then the post second world war migration and now into the future from our asian region we we are constantly dealing with our cultural expression our, t our understanding our artistic expression our indigenous inheritance our indigenous artwork is the most iconic one would have to say, of those artistic expressions. And I feel that, you know, we, we take it for granted that we um, have a cultural life. You know, people talk about Melbourne, our city, yours and mine, that is the cultural capital of Australia. And sometimes I wonder... Of course. We say that, we say that but what do we mean by that? You know, what do we mean by it? Um, and I look at other countries um, of the world that have... Uh, ministries of culture that are devoted to the preservation of important uh, historical artefacts and all sorts of other things. And I just feel it's time that we need to bring a lot of that together in a way that is uh, meaningful. And then, of course, it supports. So you don't have to constantly come and beg um, for your cause. You don't have to constantly come up here and convince politicians that yours is a worthy existence because the truth is without our art and without our culture I don't know that we actually exist fully and as a wholesome society and our identity will constantly be in doubt as a result of that. Yeah yeah that's that is exactly right and you know if you can imagine I mean just think about what we would have to do and progress and have achieved as a nation to have an arts and culture portfolio that that included um, or that 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 um, included as foundational our First Nations culture that isn't uh, you know the, the inheritance but contemporary First yes. Nations culture uh, yes. I mean we're so far from uh, you know, having earned the possibility of, of, you know, the kinds of respectful relationship that would be that would be needed. We've gone in such backward steps in terms of um, not even being able to have that conversation mm -hmm. at the federal level around the voice to parliament. Um, yeah. And so there's, yeah, there's so many, there's so many steps to go before getting there. And yet when we think about um, um, cultural policy in terms of um, cultural diverse in Australia mm -hmm. and um, uh, what has been also then added to by various migrant cultures. I feel like there's um, 
there have been periods in previous decades where we were doing better in that area than we are now. Well, if you're referring to the multiculturalism policy that, uh, you know, was, was sort of uh, created and implemented some 40 odd, 45 years ago that gave rise to institutions such as special broadcasting services and, um, you know, racial discrimination acts and so forth, uh, there was a time when we did it better. However, uh, multiculturalism today means different things, I think, to different people. But for me personally, it is the story, the ongoing story of Australia's development as a country. And it does reflect in particular um, the large numbers of migrants who came to this country and who, through the economy, because art is also, I mean, supporting the artists is also about supporting the economy and supporting the livelihoods of people who are artists, who actually have the talent and the capacity to give expression, artistic expression, to, to our, our, our to our society and it, and it's something that you do it's a skill it's a talent it's a gift and it, it to, to a lot of people as we know um, it is ways of earning a living and when that's jeopardized as well we, we have all sorts of other problems which I'm sure you've spoken about and you will but with multiculturalism for me it's the stories and the experiences of the large waves of migrants that have come to this country, their contributions now need to be part of the mainstream Australian story in the same way that our Indigenous um, people and our Indigenous experience and history is a significant part of the Australian story. It's not something that just sits out there that we can pick or choose or decide we want to take an interest in. It's inherent to who Australia is. And, and I think that um, these are the issues that interest me uh, because I know that it's through the political process itself that you can aid um, the development and achieve the things that we want to achieve in the cultural artistic expression of this country. So, um, you know, I, I, I just feel that uh, one of the challenges that you, you artists generally would have is basically trying to, I guess, convince politicians that um, theirs is a job that needs to be protected uh, it's an industry that needs to be supported financially uh, in order to grow and develop. Um, and uh, beyond that, it's integral to who we are. And I couldn't imagine a society without artistic expression. Oh, well, goodness, no. It wouldn't I be a society. Like a society anyway. No, no. I live in it, whatever, in the dark, that's fine, but I don't. <laughs> no. And look, and, and, and Esther, just also the whole importance of creative expression as a way of dealing with another issue of our time and that is the the, the increase in mental health issues and and knowing how artistic expression and art itself can can lend such an important role play such an important role in helping management and dealing with these sorts of issues um, you know it's, I don't know how else to explain its importance <laughs> to be honest with you to our society. <laughs> I think we all very much get to that point where we feel that there's, there's so many different ways that we mm. have, you know, put mm. forward the, the importance mm. of the arts. And certainly in the last, you know, three months, um, uh, it has been, you know, the, the, the um, artists and arts lovers and audiences yes. and, and the industry have been put under a lot of pressure to, um, uh, to keep reiterating and reiterating uh, the the value but also the way in which the sector works as we were saying before it's it's unfortunately uh, not sufficiently understood by this government as we see in the statements that, that keep coming out um, and as people will see in uh, arts agenda if you're if you're subscribed to Nava's arts agenda which is for uh, academics policy makers and journalists it's monthly issues uh, in in national policy as they relate to the arts and in tomorrow's one we are putting out a fact check uh, on some of the um, you know unfortunately uh, uh, misleading unhelpful mm -hmm. statements that have been made mm -hmm. lately um, and so that's you know at a time where the sector is already under pressure just trying to get through this crisis uh, there's yeah a lot of hard work in sort of repositioning but I just want to go back to what you're saying about um, when you're talking about that positioning um, that um, uh, you, you were just saying we can't um, pick and choose uh, the the cultures uh, who make up Australia. We are foundationally a First Nations um, mm -hmm. um, uh, 
culture, we have yeah, we migrant are. cultures, um, and yet um, it seems that quite often when we look at, um, you know, the way in which um, our government responds to certain cultural issues, that there is a bit of a picking and choosing that's happening. In particular, I'm thinking of the way that uh, different parliamentarians in the last week have responded to uh, the Black Lives Matters protests, the issues um, which we're all very concerned about in the US, um, the really incredible ways that um, mm -hmm. um, advocates in Australia have brought a lot of people together to highlight the fact, of course, that issues of um, racism, discrimination, and black deaths in custody are lights on our culture. And yet, unfortunately, what we hear from some parliamentarians is that um, um, we're importing issues or we're somehow choosing to make these things an issue. What happens with those, you know, huge disconnections between the yeah. fundamentally diverse reality of Australian culture and its First Nations foundation and that willful disconnection um, on the part of some of our parliamentarians? Well, I think with the parliamentarians, it may have suggested we're importing um, those same politicians. I don't, I'm not going to name them because thankfully I don't know who they are, but that whole issue of importing, uh, are people choose to import what they uh, to choose to what they want to import. I mean, we import a lot of things, but what happened on the weekend um, wasn't necessarily, it, it may have been um, fired up by what happened in the United States. But what it does tell you is that we have an ongoing issue in our country and we have not yet reconciled ourselves with that Indigenous past that we have. It's, it's, it's not gone and it's disappeared. It's still here. We have not reconciled ourselves. So we're, we're a country that's trying to manage its multicultural community, its, its migrant waves, but also its Indigenous um, communities. So... It, it, it's not a question of importing something from the United States last weekend. Um, there were, I mean, I had some concerns with the rally in so far as we're all trying to adhere to some sort of social distancing. You know, we're dealing with COVID, uh, but that's separate to the fact that a lot of the people that attended the rallies were younger people. And um, to me, uh, I, I've always believed that young people are the generation, the next generation of leaders. And they have to carry the fire in their belly to bring about change. So as much as on the one hand I was concerned about the possible undermining of the, you know, of the states and federal government trying to maintain social distancing and those sorts of behaviours, which are difficult to because as I've observed uh, going around too, human, it's counterintuitive to be a human being, isn't it? To have to constantly be sure you're 1.5 metres away from each other and you instinctively put out your hand to shake it, uh, mm -hmm. instinctively want to embrace somebody. So it's hard doing that sort of stuff. But I think what we can take from the rallies last week was that it may have taken an incident, and it was an appalling incident, by the way, um, overseas, but the fact that it, 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 it sort of sparked such outrage here was the incident itself was was terrifying. It was a public execution by police of, a, of, of, an innocent, of a citizen. That's what it was. Um, and I can't see it as anything else other than that. Uh, but it also, under, uh, you know, it, it reveals that we have issues here <laughs> that need to be dealt with, yeah. that haven't been dealt with. And I was, on the one hand, very pleased to see so many young people take up this pattern. I think that's really important. The next step is how that advocacy and activism is used in a way to, be, to bring about you know, to, to raise the issues, to bring about the change that we want. And that process often is a lot more complicated. Um, so once we've had the, the huge show of support or demand for action, we then need to follow that up with a, a process that brings about the change that we want. And I don't, we haven't succeeded as yet. Um, and that's why I believe that telling stories through, through artistic, anything from theatre, to, to to visual arts to anything they tell this is a process of telling stories and reaching people and and appealing to people's emotions in a way that I believe moves change in a more effective way um, sometimes uh, or combined so this is where art has an important role 
in itself to play in the lo in lobbying and, and bringing about change. The work itself and the expression, the artistic expression itself, as well as the advocacy that you're involved in and everyone else is involved oh, in. Oh, I think that's an incredibly important point that, you know, yeah. often, um, artists often um, struggle with that question of, mm. you know, is art political? Uh, am I being political by being an artist? Maybe I don't art want to political. be political. Art is political. <laughs> but of course, yes, it is. of course yes. it is. Of course Absolutely it is. Absolutely it is. And there's a lot of reasons for that. You know, mm. art invites us to shift out of a mode of consumption. Yes. Art offers an object uh, yes. whose value is inestimable. Um, yes. Art asks us to reconfigure our values and to stop and pause in ways that can be entirely self-directed on our own agenda. You know, art can ask some very direct questions, um, but it also unsettles us. And I think often a lot of um, a lot of parliamentarians, in particular, uh, I think often a nervous about engaging with the arts you know maybe some will ask them a question and, and they won't know how to respond maybe they don't understand it as well you've got to allow for that possibility yeah a lot of people think arts a nuanced thing i mean in terms of it's being political if you look at some of the great political um, movements historically not just well more so abroad some of the uh, you know, enduring icons of those revolutions have been poets writers artists you know, they've been the most enduring um, mm. symbols of, of those of those movements for change, whether it's in South America, Europe, wherever it might be. Um, and so I think we need to start our own little revolution here, uh, if I can say that. Um, but we need to know what we want to achieve and what our cause is. And if that's clear, then we can proceed. All right, let's plan exactly that. We've got a question <laughs> from Grace Lennon, um, who says that uh, the comment that you made earlier so succinctly summed up one of the key issues with articulating the value of the arts to society, where you were raising a few points, then you said, well, I don't know how else to say it, uh, which is a kind of the way we say when it's just like, well, of course, you know, we know this, we understand this fundamentally, but then we try to convey it to someone else and particularly someone who yes. might not be... Um, uh, yeah, be be comfortable with um, with either engaging in a conversation or might be nervous thinking that you know talking about art is some elitist thing. Uh, so Grace asks, do you think you could perhaps provide some insight into whether or not you think it's necessary to develop a clear narrative for articulating the value of the arts to society at a parliamentarian level? So I think Grace, it, it, you're asking then about. Um, this is a, a clarifi yes, clarification question for Grace. Yes. Um, Grace, are you asking whether, so we, we all need to be clearer um, or um, parliamentarians should have more of that clarity? Either, either way. Either uh, way. I took it that Grace meant... Um, the latter. The, 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 yeah, I mean, I think you need to be very clear about positioning art, uh, our artistic community and the role of art that's why i like the idea of an art and culture because if you've got an institution that's that's brought all this together it helps to articulate a more um a, a, you know a, a narrative that actually has a place at the table because most of the engagements around art and the art is about funding and you know how much funding and, and it's 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 a, a lot of politicians in the past it's it's a lazy way of just saying Oh, you know, we're going to allocate X amount of funds and that's it, thank you. Um, you might not be happy with it, but you can come back and argue for some more. Um, I just find that the fact that this, that, that we have a, a, a Ministry of Art and Communication, um, someone did point out to me that art is about communication and I said, yes, it certainly is, but I don't know what the NBN and art have <laughs> necessarily got in common. <laughs> so it irates me that we, we don't have an exclusive space where we can develop all of this, where you can encourage young artists to, to do some think, to do thinking, to, to write, to, to actually put forward um, a, 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 a policy or a narrative that actually is clear to decision makers that this is something that is a significant part. It's as important to the Australian community as its economy is, as other things are, because they're all interrelated and it's really important to us in terms of the formation of our identity and the, you know, showcasing who we are. And if that's yeah. not important to us, I don't know what is. 
Yeah. Oh, goodness, yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, to, to, to elaborate on that, something that um, we've been talking about just the last couple of weeks in this section around policy and policy context, could you tell us a bit about um, just comparing now uh, to the other people who will come to your office and talk about the kinds of policy change that's needed? How does the arts differ in, in in that sense in terms of you know having and presenting that clear narrative or that clear case well, Esther, and, you know other than my association with NAVA and establishing the friendship group which actually was a very important part of providing a platform to start these discussions up here because they have to happen up here as well they also have to happen in the community I don't get a lot of I mean I must say to you in in recent times the people that have come to see me about the importance of art to them and their expressions have really been my newly arrived refugees from Iraq who, who and I learned through them that art is really important to, to them um, and, and therefore they, they came to see me about establishing and getting support and getting some funding for an association so that they can actually have somewhere where they can showcase their artwork which is very yeah, much wow. an expression that's of their great. own I, yeah and i and i thought okay well that's terrific i was really impressed by that but i don't get very many requests for that sort of advocacy um and i think it's really important for the artist the artist community uh, or your organizations if you're networked well you would be able to ensure that members of parliament are visited um maybe not every five minutes but certainly at least once a year um and and uh, you know local artists can go and have a conversation with their federal members of parliament and their state but their federal more importantly to talk to them about these issues the conversations that we're having at this moment should be had throughout the year in the various communities in the in the electorates and and I think getting to know your federal MP as an organization is is a, is a really good start of engaging um, and, and uh, you know, I would, I would really recommend that, you know, something like that, a program like that was pursued because, um, you know, there would probably be members of parliament who've never really talked to an artist's organisation. I mean, we can do it up here and I look forward to doing it up here, but I think that there's scope for continuing that conversation back home in, in the electorates. I'm so glad. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm so glad you mentioned that because mm -hmm. it's something that um, we've been talking about kind of consistently through this program, and something that JA mentioned a month mm -hmm. ago as mm -hmm. well, and mm -hmm. something that you and I have talked about before. Mm -hmm. That um, one of the big learnings of Arts Day on the Hill last year, where we had back-to-back -back half hour mm -hmm. meetings with mm -hmm. MPs across two days, mm -hmm. was the number of MPs who said, I have never had an arts conversation before. No one has ever approached me. Mm. And it's absolutely astounding. Mm. Uh, you know, there's just, mm. there is so much of a, uh, a, a, a disconnection, it seems, uh, a reluctance of us to um, engage politically in that direct way mm -hmm. uh, but so many ways um, that that we do in 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 other ways and so you know maintaining those direct relationships is just so so important tell us about apart from the arts um, who are um, you know without you know mentioning mm -hmm. specific names and so on but just keen for everyone to get a sense of you know like a typical sitting period for you um, what are the kinds of groups who are coming and having those meetings with you um, and how would you characterize I guess some of the really clear effective ones so we're just going back now to that question of a clear narrative and that space that we're competing with um, when it comes to the way uh, that a parliamentarian is 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 used to being uh, approached well I mean I'll, I'll try and, and, and I mean there, there, there are certain um, advocacy groups that are, are that are you know almost part of the furniture and I don't mean that in a derogatory way I mean that in you know part of the furniture up here and they'll, they'll come up here um, you know time and time again just before the budget in particular is a good time to be up here um, and, and and so a, a lot of them are, are you know the the um, early education people, um, obviously welfare organisations. I mean, these are the obvious ones, the health, 
health organisations. I mean, John and I also co-chair the Heart and Stroke Foundation today. We did another one of these little Zoom things um, on the launch of their uh, latest data on cholesterol levels. I mean, there's a lot that goes on here. Um, and I think that you need to establish a tradition of, uh, of, of, of being here and being part of that institutionalised advocacy groups that we all expect to come and see us, um, you know, throughout throughout uh, the parliamentary year. Uh, in the case of the arts, I find that local government seems to be a lot more closely associated with its local arts communities, especially through the development of you know arts centres. And some some you know local governments have got some great arts centres and so forth. So maybe you might want to start having conversations with local government as well and trying to get onto their getting the arts and, and, and onto their advocacy agendas also because they also come up here. Oh, that's a, a really important yeah. point. So as many of us are aware, yeah. local government yeah. is the yeah. biggest owner of um, art galleries and museums and their collections Absolutely. in Australia, yeah. as well as performing arts yeah. centres. Yes. And um, their head of arts policy is a member of, of our National Visual Arts Roundtable. And so mm -hmm. those are very much ongoing conversations. Yeah, I, I think it's really, yeah, yeah, especially want to get, get on to that. Yeah, especially um, at this difficult time because, of course, yes. local government have been excluded from all of the yes, they have been. income yes. support measures. That's right. And they, they are have. a big employer of artists as well. Yes. Um, and that's yes. a huge gap right now. So, yeah, I'm really glad you mentioned local government. And I think when you do, when, when we get, I mean, at the moment, I mean, you've got to really look at what happens post COVID. I think the story of people who artists who lost their jobs, who lost their all sorts of, you know, their, 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 their I mean, I know of people who can't afford to pay their rent. We know all those stories and the impact of that is going to be hopefully not too long lasting. Hopefully we'll be able to resume, but let's, let's look at resuming in a way that re, that um, sees the arts become a, an important part of advocacy up here yes uh, and i think that that's what we want to be doing now i mean everyone's even this government i mean we've talked about you know the need to to, to help people who've lost their jobs as long as you know who are artists um a lot of people have lost their jobs a lot of people have been stood down but the arts community in particular um is, is, is having is doing it really tough um and i think you need to look back on it and reflect and see what did it what did it cost us as a community we know it'll cost the individual artist but what does it cost us as a community our local councils i mean the ability you know they've had to stand down you know that sort of relationship between community and local government through its artistic expression is very important i think an assessment um, an audit of what it cost us as a community and as individuals and the economy is really important because only then then you can come and say well you know what we've had the crisis look what it cost us yeah do we want to go do we ever want to go back there again no we don't that is such an important idea and uh, it's something that um, certainly we are holding a small summit around mm -hmm. uh, uh, the visual arts sector on that in yeah. late July so we can do exactly yeah. that assessing and then the bigger kind of policy question what has this what thinking has this opened up mm -hmm. exactly so we're doing that mm -hmm. that constructive mm -hmm. stuff mm -hmm. we have got a question from Louise Rollman who's interested in hearing more from Maria about what's involved in establishing a ministry of arts and culture are there perhaps examples or models elsewhere and is it possible to drive such a project in opposition or oh, the latter kind of not quite in terms of the establishing of a portfolio but 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 Tell us, Maria, um, what would that mean? When I started to think about this, I looked at other countries. I looked mm. at uh, Greece when the late Melina Mercuri, and she'd been known to everyone, famous, famous artist herself, an actress, and uh, uh, you know, spearheaded the the restitution of the Parthenon marbles. Uh, she established a ministry of culture, um, and I looked at Latin American countries that established ministries of culture, and for there it was about. I think it was Guatemala from memory. Don't hold me to it because um, at my age I tend to you know, <laughs> forget. But I was fascinated with this particular South American country because they were trying to, the Ministry of Culture was being established in order to bring together the, the cultural diversity of the country and to help it form uh, around a, a national identity. 
Um, in the case of Greece, um, it was about revitalising re, re, re and reappointing Greece's cultural inheritance. Um, I think there are ample, we can look at the French, I think we can look at other countries and look at why a Ministry of Culture is important to those countries. I think our time has come and I personally believe that it is up to the community not just the artists in the community, but also other support groups to start to call for something like this. But then you need to be able to articulate the reason for it. For me, it's about bringing together the Australian identity. And I think and establishing that's... contemporary Australia with, uh, of course, and, 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 you know, and how we bring our Indigenous art into this as well. I mean, those are discussions that need to be had because they've always, in terms of multiculturalism, we talked about it in the past, multiculturalism was kept, Indigenous affairs were kept separately. Uh, I'm very fascinated to see a lot of the migrant activists and second generation members of migrant communities who are now joining forces with our Indigenous communities to work towards reconciliation and recognition and so forth. And I think that time is now, it has finally come to bring those groups together, not to, um, not to undermine each other's identity, but rather to work together to help go forward um, and tell the Australian story. That, so we need you guys to start writing and start singing, start doing all the things that previous revolutionary artists did to bring about change. Yes, exactly. All of the ways to bring about change. It's such a good way of putting it. Um, Kerry McKenzie is saying, could there be a federally funded expo for the arts held in Canberra for the states to send groups to to promote regional galleries and events, let the pollies know uh, what there is out there? It's interesting you suggest that, Kerry, because um, the former curator of the collection at Parliament House, Justine Van Morick, who unfortunately has recently left Parliament House and she is now at the Art Gallery of South Australia. Okay. Um, she, yeah, she, she'll be missed because she was quite fantastic. I'm not mm. sure um, if her replacement mm. has been announced yet. Mm. Um, but yes, Justine was often talking about, you know, we need to um, set up basically an art fair in the Great Hall, you know, for a day and, um, mm. and uh, you know, in, in the way that art fairs are established around Australia. Um, and, uh, you know, we had all these ideas and models and, you know, what it would cost and, and so on, but, uh, you know, a way for um, MPs and staff to just kind of wander in and kind of go, right, you know, that gallery's there. Oh, that's actually in my electorate. Um, but, of course, nothing quite replaces engagement in the electorate, does it, Maria? But, uh, but uh, the, the engagement in the electorate is important to, to, you know, shore up your MP's interest and awareness because then they'll come up here. I think the idea of a a federally funded expo is a very good idea. It's a very specific request. If you can put it together, then you need to advocate for it. Um, because I think having it up here in the capital is, is it just makes a lot of sense. Um, and you know, this place, I don't know how many works of art we've got, but who sees them? I've got four in my office, they're terrific. But I, I, why we couldn't, I mean, this whole idea of making it available to people to see as well, and, and it is really important. And I think that the time has come possibly to ask for a federally funded expo, as that question is put to me. I think it's a great idea. And I think that that's where we need to be aiming at now. We really do need to be coming up with very specific um, suggestions about how we, uh, um, you know, reappoint or reposition um, art and artists into the future. And also how we teach our communities to appreciate they can't see what we've. They can't see the work. They can't learn from it. And they can't appreciate it. So our curator might be gone, but I don't think the idea is dead. I think the idea it should remain alive. Should oh, I agree. And we know that um, Gordon Ramsay, the Minister for the Arts in the ACT, has been very, um, very vocal about um, what he understands very, very closely as the important role that arts and culture will have for driving the ACT's economic recovery. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that could be an interesting conversation to have with him. Mm -hmm. um, as Kerry quite rightly points out, mm -hmm. a lot of festivals 
have had to be cancelled for 2020 and this has resulted of course in a lot of um you know loss for for individual artists as well as for those festivals so yes an, an arts and culture fair um now when we spoke with ja about a month ago we talked about um wouldn't it be great to get a sense from um uh you know various mps about the art they're interested in the work on their walls and we have since developed a survey uh and that has gone to um all of you guys uh and i'm not sure if ja's team have, has got that out yet but this was one action of this group was to you know give us a sense of identifying you know who are the mps mm. who are particularly engaged and interested we've met many of them who are in the parliamentary friends mm. um but um, yeah, needing to um, be able to draw on the interest that we know that some people have and then to bring them into an ongoing conversation. Oh, now we've yeah. just got a few minutes left mm -hmm. of Maria's time. Um, and it's been fantastic to get to have you with us. Um, what is the, if there is, you know, one particular um thought or action that you would like to leave everyone with we just talked about a range of things you know being really specific with our asks engaging with our mps uh making sure that we're contributing actively as advocates but also not letting go that sense of revolution and of the change that that we can make um what is the one thing that you would love to um one thought you'd love to leave everyone on this afternoon well, I, i'd like to suggest that we need to see our artists, our, the work of our artists, which becomes our, our inheritance really, uh, it, it needs to be shared with the broader community. So I, I see it as a responsibility that we all have to share that work and to find ways of sharing it because that help, that leads to more enlightenment. It's a form of educating people. It's a, it's a way of, you know, reaching out to people and, and, and helping change all sorts of attitudes. I mean, that's the power that art has. And I think to deny the broader community this and to leave it within a bubble only is actually, now I'm going to sound like a communist, but I'm, I'm just, just wanting to say that art is also something that is created to express something, but also to be shared and to reach out to the broader community and to be appreciated and to work its magic. And I think that that's what we want to be. That's what I'd like to think that we, we could get to a stage where um, you know, we, it, it was actually a right, not just a demand or a cup in hand, but the right of the broader community to know its artists, to see them, to appreciate them, to understand them. And I think that that's really where a lot of the lobbying needs to come from. It needs to come from the right of, of people to have access, not just to the, the artists to be protected and supported, which is very important because without them we don't have the art, but it also people have a right to access art regardless of what their paycheck is so it's where local government's really important and i think i'd like to see that happen and i'd like to get your support in eventually trying to get this ministry of art and culture up and become a reality it would be absolutely transformative maria thank, thank you, you so much everyone please join me in thanking maria van vakino the co-chair of the parliamentary friendship group for contemporary arts and culture you've given us lots to think about and we're going to keep talking now as we get into the workshop part of our session so thank you thank so you. much maria thank you very much see you all thank bye. you bye bye and we didn't uh, okay. to get into just what a tricky day it must have been um, in, um, in Parliament today. I'm just going to mute Maria, if I possibly can, because I just know she hasn't actually left the chat. Um, Heroes of revolutions and change were poets and artists. And, uh, and <laughs> I really hope we can do this very if you quickly. Want money, don't come here begging. Um, just excellent God. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> she was just recapping our talk uh, for her staff there, which was which was quite funny. Um, so we didn't get to uh, also talk about just what a you know busy day it had been uh, in in Parliament House um, for for today. But um, yeah, really great to have Maria on. Before we get into talking now about um, uh, reflecting back on our past few weeks, and I'll pull up the. Um, uh, our uh, uh, kit in just a sec. Has anyone got 
um, any questions for discussion about anything that Maria has just mentioned, uh, and then we'll go into uh, just some of the um, uh, the tools and techniques that we've been developing in the last little while uh, and reflecting back on our last four weeks. So um, any particular questions emerging from that? We talked about an arts and culture portfolio. Um, we talked about um, the right um, of people, of all of us in the community to be able to see and experience and understand the work of artists and to get to know artists. And I think that's a really interesting um, we don't often have that conversation around, um, um, you know, art and the access um, to art being uh, a right or a human right. Emily has just said something about background music. Um, are people hearing background music? I'm not hearing background music. Um, no. Uh, okay, Emily, I think there might be a background music situation just at your place, uh, which is deeply fascinating and I hope it is okay because, <laughs> uh, yes, no, there is there is no background music. Um, although I do sometimes wish I had hold music in my life that I could just give to people when I was thinking something through. I think that would be a really valuable uh, a really valuable thing to to be able to have in life. Let's, oh, all good. So it went away. Okay. <laughs> it's a relief. Now, I've just switched to the presentation view. Can you now see um, part two of the advocacy program um, handbook? Um, hopefully that is on your screen. Yes, thank you. Um, so again, this is um, uh, made available for NAVA members and updated with each section um, of our program. Um, so that we can um, really, you know, look at developing our skills together. Um, we looked, oh, and thank you to Leah for posting the link because I know that the screen resolution is not going to be great for everyone. Some people are also on devices. Let's have a look at um, what we've been talking about the last little while um, and then um, let's have a bit of a workshop on understanding the policy areas that we've just been talking about the last four weeks. So I'm going to just uh, coast over our early conversations about what is advocacy, being constructive and compelling, uh, putting forward your opinion, your experience with, 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 with confidence, and in particular about having the kinds of conversations where you tell a story, you paint a picture, you, you elaborate on a situation, you give examples, but you do so in such a way that is so compelling because it's yours. Uh, it's so compelling that the person who you're speaking to is inspired and motivated to have that conversation again, whether they agree with you or not. That, to my mind, is the fundamental um, of advocacy and then it scaffolds and builds into some really complex government relations, media relations, public relations. Um, and as Nadia is just pointing out, uh, there's that distinction, of course, between um, uh, as we see here, uh, between advocacy um, and activism. Nadia is saying she'd like to chat about how we walk the line between being activists, that is sometimes saying uncomfortable things that politicians don't want to hear, but also approaching politicians in ways that make them listen and engage, which sometimes means being palatable um, for or, or, or forming relationships. Um, and it's going to link that to Gabrielle Sullivan's question, an interesting take from Maria that the audiences for artists' work should also be part of the lobbying to politicians and policy makers. They are always the population that are being asked to respond to surveys about the value of the arts. Maybe we need to take the voice of our audiences along with us. I think both of those are incredibly important questions, Nadia and Gabrielle. Um, when we think, for example, about um, when we hear about sports in the media, in particularly the last few months, um, we often hear commentators and even journalists saying you know, how much they're looking forward to, uh, you know, their favourite team being able to play again, you know, the, the gap in their lives, in their social lives of not having uh, the, the AFL on the weekend. Uh, and absolutely these conversations, these, um, you know, 
networks and tactics that we're building, they have to bring in audiences to the arts because if it's just us talking to ourselves then um, and going to Nadia's question about um, saying the uncomfortable things and the way we approach politicians, we can't risk politicians thinking that, you know, we're just trying to line our own pockets or speaking only to ourselves uh, that you know there are millions of audiences out there and we don't tend to be able to harness them I think that's really really important um, um, on the question of um, um, activism uh, versus listening and engaging I think it's about the different um, the different functions I guess of different kinds of advocacy and what we want to achieve so sometimes if we look at Bill Moyer's uh, framework here, which we elaborate into the NAVA advocacy framework, um, if we look at um, this framework, which we talked about some weeks ago, the roles of different, different agents, different players, different roles in broader campaigns, um, you know, we need, of course, to have people who are reformers, who are looking at, at, at policy change, who've actually got a sense of what it means to, to change policy. We need these people hard at work engaging with the known channels. We need those visionary people who can bring large numbers of people together and, and, and articulate the future. That's hugely important. Um, we need... Um, what is called here um, rebels, activists. We need people who are willing to change and break the rules um, and break our usual ways of thinking and, you know, occupy the streets and do things in bold ways. And then we also need the citizens, the general public. We need ways of engaging people that shift them uh, but also bring people into a conversation. And so, of course, um, among all of these, and we think about, um, you know, what artists um, and, um, and the sector and policy makers, the, you know, what each of these groups need to say to each other at any time, then that is the that's, that's the challenge. There are times, as we, as, as we have seen with um, the really important protests on the weekend and around the world, there are times when um, to get an urgent message across and to say this is a moment of massive change, we need to occupy streets. We need to get people thinking differently. We need to mobilise, um, you know, the most um, bold and radical elements that we can. And then in doing that, um, yes, as Nadia points out, we might sometimes um, uh, say things that politicians don't want to hear. But of course, we're doing multiple things at the one time. You know, for, for as you know, there are, there were tens and tens of thousands of people on the streets in Australia on the weekend, and there have also been tens and thousands of expert. Uh, policy makers, socially engaged practitioners, as, as Joanna Herbig has just pointed out, um, educators, academics who are also developing um, in that long-term change way um, the issues and the, and the focuses that are needed. The downside, of course, is that we rarely bring all of these people together um, to achieve that one focus, that one narrative uh, in the same way. And that is a huge, huge challenge. Kerry's just noted that the last two weeks have given us a crash course in what is effective and what doesn't work. Tell us some more about that, Kerry, because, yeah, I think they they really have. Um, whether we're talking about uh, the BLM protests and uh, issues um, or whether we're talking about uh, the challenge of the arts in being heard um, uh, around COVID-19 response, um, I can see Kerry's just typing some examples about, yeah, the, the what is effective and, and, and what doesn't work. Um, because, of course, as people have been um, telling us week after week in, in this program, what we need to be able to do to achieve policy change, you know, to achieve political change, is to engage in this kind of activity long term um, so that we are bringing, you know, bringing on board um, the politicians 
the future ministers, the future decision makers, but also so that um, in the various party room discussions, uh, there is an informed diversity of voices uh, talking about arts and culture in a lot of different ways. Kerry says, when people have joined together in protest with a peaceful but clear message, they are heard by a far greater audience. Yeah, um, that's, that's, um, that's exactly right. Um, and it's really difficult at this time uh, where we've got um, physical distancing restrictions, we've got social media which connects us in some ways but also binds us to certain algorithms. Um, a lot of our advocacy conversations and through this program is about what are the structures that we have and how can we use them to our effect? So question for everyone, what are some of the, the different structures that we have? Um, and let's go to um, the section here, which is about how do we develop an advocacy strategy? Um, what are the tools that we have and how have we seen them used in the last few weeks? Uh, Kerry's pointing out the arts needs to find the currency of each of our parliamentarians. Yeah, and that's where we need, so true, Kerry, that's where we need, you know, large numbers of us well distributed across Australia because getting to know our parliamentarians is hugely important. We're going to spend several weeks talking about that in the weeks leading up to Arts Day on the Hill. We're going to talk about uh, getting to know a politician, planning a meeting, building that relationship. Uh, and again, the more of us who are who are doing that, the better. So um, we've seen in the last few weeks um, some things that have worked and some things that haven't worked when it comes to the way that, uh, you know, a lot of us in the arts have been trying to um, contribute to a public conversation. Uh, Michaela is saying this brings us back to something we discussed in the first week the need for a more combined, clear argument from the art sector rather than sometimes an art form specific piecemeal approach. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Um, and something that, of course, Nada has been doing all oh, for decades, but certainly the last little while, is bringing together, you know, a few hundred organisations from all art forms to have those key moments of, of big unity and advocacy. Um, everyone is, you know, is so busy focused on uh, the emergency issues in their sector and of course lacking a national group makes that very difficult and so we're trying to yeah collaborate as best we can but which is why it's great that we've set this timeline for ourselves leading towards Art Day on the Hill which last year did involve organisations from all art forms and so we will do that once again so that we're spending the next few months um, building uh, that narrative and then making our day of advocacy focus on the 12th of August and then continuing that. Um, oh, and thank you, Michaela, who's saying it's, it's been lovely to see. She's been loving seeing other advocating across the board. It's a very strong message from the visual arts sector. Well, here, here. But it's also, as NAVA members know and, and, and tell us quite often, um, our members um, engage in a really broad range of practices. You know, contemporary practice in visual arts is experimental, it is performative, it is ephemeral, it takes place in a public place, it's socially engaged, um, you know, it is such a great diversity of practitioners who, who we're talking about. Um, and so let's look now at... Um, I mentioned a while ago, and I'm not sure how clearly this is going to come up on the screen, but I'm hoping that those of you who've already got the kit um, are seeing this on your own screens. I mentioned a while ago that I had put together a very brief history of arts policy in Australia. This is just a one page document. Um, and I've got three columns here. So it's very abstracted because I've just got uh, the three uh, biggest parties in Australia today, the Labor Party, the Greens and the Liberal National Coalition. So, you know, I haven't got um, 
you know, the history with the Democrats, the DLP, you know, et cetera, et cetera, who kind of morphed and, and, and uh, formed, you know, various kinds of um, contributions to all of this at different times. Has everyone had um, a chance to have a look at um, this very brief history of arts policy in Australia um, and would like to make um, a contribution or ask a question uh, to get a discussion going about why is it um, uh, that arts or cultural policy has never survived a change of government in Australia. So this is, um, you know, a huge issue for us and we look at, um, um, you know, really uh, the Australia Council is kind of the exception that proves the rule. Um, there have, of course, been governments, as we've seen, who have um, deliberately undermined the effectiveness of the Australia Council, um, but it was established with bipartisan support. Um, I don't know how clearly everyone can see uh, this on their screen, um, and please be uh, entering your questions into the chat so we can have a look at, again, why we have not had arts and cultural policy survive a change of government in Australia. So if we go back to the very beginning, oh, thank you, Nicolette, I'm glad it's clear. Um, right in the beginning, um, the Commonwealth Art Advisory Board, which was um, developed back in 1912, around that time, in fact, before that time, the very first um, national arts funding in Australia was for literature to develop uh, a uniquely Australian literature. So this goes to what Maria was saying about identity, about um, an arts and culture portfolio supporting, um, you know, that great developing of what, what identity uh, even means, um, the way that art, um, you know, um, completely unsettles um, the way that we think invites us to reconsider um, our values, invites us to, to uh, think and engage in a very different way and, and to question who we are. Another one of the great reasons why art is political. Um, we then had then going into the 50s, so we leap across to the Liberal National Column now, um, where under the Menzies government, um, some, some performing arts companies who've now formed the major performing arts um, were the first to be publicly funded, the Elizabethan Theatre Trust and others um, who became um, uh, the opera, the ballet, et cetera. Um, and then um, around this time, the Holt government announced uh, what would become the Australia Council uh, it was then the Whitlam government who finally implemented it. Um, and then um, uh, there was, it was already time by the 70s to have a review of major performing arts. Um, and um, there was an idea to maybe look more broadly, look at education and innovation. Um, uh, that was that was rejected. Conversations started to happen about tax incentives, very, very important for investment. But unfortunately, uh, when that was established, um, the Australia Council's funding was cut. Um, so this was, you know, now starting to have the, the, the beginnings already of undermining the Australia Council when it had only just been established in, in 73. Um, we go across to... Um, uh, the 80s now um, and the Maclay report which restructured the Australia Council its funding was increased uh, by 40% in three years after that cut the Register of Cultural Organisations was established which allowed um, non-profit arts organisations to exist in ways that um, benefit from tax breaks uh, to operate as charities and to open up um, various opportunities for investment. Um, at around that time, though, there was a proposal from the Shadow Arts Minister to abolish the Australia Council and return ministerial control, direct control in decision making. It's a very interesting paper, actually. I don't know if anyone's read it, that Chris Puklik wrote at the time, um, where he was talking about um, just how wrong it was that the 
uh, that peer review was taking ministerial responsibility away uh, and that, in fact, um, politicians should be able to decide what art is made. Uh, it makes for fascinating reading today uh, because, as we know, um, that is still... Uh, that is still the opinion held by many, many ministers. Um, at around this time, um, the Australian Greens formed uh, nationally, uh, having existed at state level for some time. Um, there was a, um, the release of um, Creative Nation, the Keating government policy, which people still look back on as, um, you know, one of the real high watermarks um, for arts policy in Australia, so having a comprehensive policy and also ambitious funding. Unfortunately, the government then changed uh, and then we had um, a range of things happen, including the importance of legislation of moral rights and the visual arts and crafts strategy, um, which um, uh, also included a, you know, a, a, a boost in, in funding, but also more funding for the major performing arts as well. Um, and as we've been discussing um, through the last few months, the major performing, the um, rather the visual arts and crafts strategy is no longer fit for purpose. And we do need a new compact between state and federal government, but also local government, as Maria was quite rightly saying. Um, as I'm going through this overview, please be um, adding questions to the chat about any aspect of the, the steps here. What does this show us about what arts and culture has meant at different times to different politicians and what lessons can we draw for our advocacy for now? Um, so then um, there was a change of government um, and um, um, at the introduction of new directions for the arts, resale of royalty was committed, uh, very important, um, and a, um, a whole process around a national cultural policy was developed. And at this time, there were a number of reviews that happened at, at roughly the same time. The Australia Council was reviewed. There was also a big national consultation about what should arts and cultural policy look like. And many of us and many of you who are here this evening were directly involved in that. Uh, and then uh, policy was released, um, but it was released at a time of massive um, political volatility. Um, and very soon after its release, Simon Crean was no longer the Arts Minister um, and um, uh, Minister Burke released Renewing Creative Australia, uh, the National Cultural Policy, really interesting and comprehensive document. And uh, then there was, uh, now that's absolutely wrong that year, it's not 2019, 2014. Um, so we will fix that, oops. Um, um, actually, no, 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 that's right. Cream launched that. Sorry, I'm getting myself into a muddle. Uh, 2019, Shadow Minister Burke did release a substantial policy last year. So let's rewind me to just a couple of moments ago. Um, the extensive consultation around the national cultural policy was a politically volatile time, a lot of changes of leadership. Uh, there was then a change of government and then um, uh, we had what we've come to describe as the Brandis Raid, which was um, that completely uh, unexpected, unannounced um, draining of the Australia Council's funds and um, complete undermining of a really interesting, ambitious strategic plan that the Australia Council had launched. Um, of course, the sector got together and um, made sure that um, that would come to an end um, and that those funds would be returned to the Australia Council. Unfortunately, not all of those funds were. And um, the Australia Council, again, from that second high watermark uh, in arts policy and funding, um, the Australia Council's funds have not recovered from that time. And it's just incredible, I have to say, that they've been able to repurpose um, internal funds now for the $5 million resilience fund and all the other great work that they're doing at the moment. 
And so in the lead up to last year's federal election, Shadow Minister Burke did release Renewing Creative Australia, which was um, the policy uh, that they were taking to the election. Unfortunately, um, there was no such policy or focus uh, for, uh, from um, the coalition but there was also a, a policy that was launched um, by the Greens to really continue and step up that conversation. Uh, and they had also endorsed a national policy back in 2017 as well and are advocating for a range of things now. Uh, Gabrielle Sullivan says, would it be worthwhile lobbying for a bipartisan arts and culture policy or would that not stroke enough egos? No one person could claim the legacy. I think I just answered my own question, she says. Well. Gabrielle, this is the question of our entire program. And it's, um, you know, what can we achieve that lasts through changes of government? Is it about uh, a policy that continues? Is it about different uh, kinds of, um, you know, particular instruments or strategies within government that can last? Um, you know, we've got the Australia Council, the Office for the Arts, a range of different funding frameworks tax incentives, you know, think of all of these structures that have survived changes of government. This is the, you know, this very brief history tells us what hasn't survived and that has been the policy uh, that might not stroke enough ego so that no one person could claim the legacy. But the things that have survived changes of government have resulted in improvements for all of us. So the Australia Council, things like um, tax incentives uh, for investments, some of which come and go in different ways, moral rights legislation, resale royalty legislation, um, the, those, um, the, 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 the VAX framework and what will come next. So one thing we do, of course, is look at the instruments you know that that can be developed and and applied, and so that's the that's the practical side of the things that we achieve. But of course, if as we were saying earlier, we had a culture across the parliament um, and publicly where MPs were genuinely interested in an ongoing conversation about the arts, then we could look at shifting that culture. Uh, as Kerry says, the electorate has to value the arts and let MPs know that it will affect how they vote. Uh, and that is exactly the kinds of things that, that we will be talking about uh, in coming weeks. How are we going to make sure that we give ourselves, um, our colleagues and our audiences the tools to do just that? Lisa Corsi has asked, is there a link to the 1988 public um, statement and uh, policy I've had a good look and I just can't find it and I'm really irritated because I have written a piece that refers to it and I've got to find I've actually got I've got to go back on my own archive because I must have it somewhere um, I, I wrote a piece where I looked at the specific language I think I've just answered my own question I'm just going to scribble myself a note I've, I've just been saying that aloud realized um, the piece that I wrote um, and where it was published okay uh, right Thank you, Lisa, for inspiring me to remember that. So I wrote a piece which is about the particular language that politicians have used over the years to justify um, direct attacks on the Australia Council or on peer-reviewed or peer-assessed funding or the language that they use to make particular decisions. So I will find that and share it. Uh, and you are welcome, Lisa. Thank you for the thank you. Um, so, yes, um, looking at this, was yeah not designed to be just a you know a bit of a downer of, on, on the things that haven't survived but for us to look at the things that have survived and those things that have survived i can tell you that um resale royalty was um a, a campaign that nava led that many others were involved in that took 20 years uh and that was going back to as we were saying earlier how do we look at this focus on um, uh, on policy makers, on sometimes, you know, when do we use the media to communicate with politicians and to communicate with the public? How do we make sure that artists have um, uh, the support 
um, that is needed to engage in politically sensitive conversations? How do we build a strong policy literate sector? These things do take time. And so when we look at change that's needed, especially right now, um, we've got to kind of look at the things that take time and the things that can be achieved far more quickly. So Ian Kemp um, asks a very timely question. I think it's important that we articulate what we are lobbying for. I've heard lots of different suggestions over the last few weeks. How would we decide something that linked all levels of government would be good? And despite the fact we are lobbying at a federal level, something that worked from the local level upwards might also be worthwhile and connect with lots of artists. Absolutely, Ian. Now, just on that, I am going to try to share my screen um, to show everyone, just remind myself how to do that. Um, now, I have a feeling that this may not work. Um, sometimes when we're late in the conversational evening, um, the, um, okay. All right, that I think is not, not going to work. Um, I'm going to make one attempt to share the screen can you now see a screen that says open letter Australian artists call for government action? You can, excellent. I'm gonna move that screen so I can still see your chat. Um, so one of the things that we're advocating for right now, and I encourage everyone uh, to join uh, if you would like, is for specific action, specific change that is needed for our sector through COVID-19. So we have a letter here which has been signed by about oh, more than 400 artists and arts workers and organisations so far. And we're talking about um, welcoming MPs back to Parliament with the urgent call to act now to ensure fair access to COVID-19 income support measures. Our work is relied upon by millions of Australians. Uh, we create the experiences that search your emotions, heighten your curiosity, reframe your expectations. Now that restrictions are being eased, we might think that everything's fine, but in fact, it's not. Um, and here are some specific things. Oh, and here's names I need to add in just a sec. Um, so specifically right now, extend JobKeeper to casuals who've been employed for at least three months, harmonise income averaging arrangements between the ATO and Centrelink. Uh, so some very specific things here about income eligibility. Uh, I'm just going to approve some of these names that everyone knows that um, I really am paying attention. Um, introduce a substantial recovery fund um, so that arts and cultural organisations can uh, reopen safely with really, really great support. Um, substantially improve the Australia Council's um, operating budget right now. Um, and establish uh, an arts and culture working group to advise the National uh, COVID-19 Coordination Commission. Now, Rose is just asking, how do you sign the letter I am going to copy the link right now and then paste it into here so that um, you can uh, jump on and, um, and sign that right now if you would like to and indeed uh, share it far and wide um, because we've already got um, a piece or two in the media about it tomorrow. Um, and this goes to the question around audiences and who are our audiences for advocacy. Um, if you uh, buy yourself a copy of the Australian Financial Review tomorrow, you will see a very uh, uh, bold interview with an artist and, um, uh, and also this story, which is incredibly important. Now, we are almost running out of time, and so I'll tell you in a moment who's up next. But I just want to point out that um, this toolkit has got a whole bunch of activities for developing the skills that we've been talking about. And we're going to keep picking up on these activities more and more in the next few weeks so that we're able to make best use of everyone being here together to develop these skills together. So. 
uh, one of the activities, this is one you know, to do together or do separately, what is Australia's arts policy? If you look at a recent policy change or funding cut or arts announcement, on what basis do you think these decisions have been made? What principles have been applied? What values have been exposed? And so how would you characterise Australia's unwritten arts and cultural policy? We often talk about the fact that there is no policy right now, but of course, decisions are being made on some basis. And so what are the principles being applied? What is Australia's unwritten arts and cultural policy? What are the funding frameworks that give us an indication of what that policy is? How did they come about? How do they relate to one another? Who's being prioritised and what's missing? And then as we saw last week, how does our arts policy sit globally? And here are some figures uh, from Dr. Jackie Bailey and the BYP group's work, um, which has been, yeah, really super interesting to see how global leaders in their response at the moment, how that's highlighted what's missing and what's needed in Australia uh, and how their responses have further exposed what our unwritten arts and cultural policy is. Now, of course, on the NAVA website at any one time, you will see the range of things that we're advocating for uh, and you'll see uh, in the news and opinion section um, uh, the pieces that we have led that have secured support from all across the arts industry and the various things that, that, that we're doing together. Now, in coming weeks, as we saw earlier, I'm just going to zoom Oops, that was out, zoom in, there we go. Looking at um, where we are at the moment, we've just had that great conversation with Maria. And I've got to say, um, the thing that always intrigues me in having any politician come and speak to us when they are not the arts minister or shadow minister, particularly with JA a month ago, is that these are the people uh, who we need to be exercising that language and that and, and that approach so that we're getting better and better at this. Because again, the arts minister, the shadow minister, they're already on side. It's when they're speaking to their political colleagues that we need those colleagues already primed to go, yes, tell me more, why aren't we supporting this? Adam Simmons says, this appears to speak from a viewpoint of visual arts, even if including broader art sector support measures. Is this for other art forms also? I note that LPA have put out their own support plan after the United Advocacy Act in the beginning. Has there been a conscious effort by advocacy groups to focus more on their own constituency rather than share a common narrative? Uh, no, not at all. In fact, just last week, um, industry organisations from all over Australia came together uh, to put together a, a letter to the chair of the COVID-19 commission to request arts and culture, at the, the establishment of an arts and culture working party. This week um, has been about um, getting some sector specific uh, information out there because of the misleading statements that have come out from politicians um, to make sure that they understand what the issues are for different sectors. So, for example, you'll have seen today uh, a great statement and letter signed by around a thousand or more uh, people from the live music industry. There are some very specific issues for those guys, as we're seeing with um, um, uh, how do you say, restrictions reopening. Um, it's a very different proposition trying to reconnect and relaunch your career um, as, you know, a, a band or, or, or a musician. Uh, you can't even imagine at the moment a, a date when you can have an audience. Um, for the visual arts, um, there are some very specific issues for us around the supporting and maintenance of collections, around reopening and social distancing, around um, the fact that JobKeeper and other support measures were never made available to universities who house our leading art schools. What happens then to um, you know, future career trajectories, education, etc. Uh, when there's been this massive undermining, um, what happens to uh, local government galleries and museums who've had no support whatsoever and have had to let staff go, or artist-run and community-run, volunteer-run uh, museums and galleries? So this week's been about. Um, given Parliament sits again, uh, getting some very specific issues out there. But no, there has not at all been um, um, 
um, a conscious decision to not develop a common narrative and we're in conversations about that all the time. Um, I chair a national executive directors network that meets once a week. Um, and then of course, in other ways, um, I'm you know passionately committed to making sure that we strengthen that national voice. It's a good question, Adam. It's at diff different times. We've got to focus on, on, on different things. So next week, we begin the next four-week chapter, and it's on understanding the media. What are journalists looking for when they're preparing a story on the arts? And we're going to be joined next week by Michaela Boland, an arts journalist with the ABC, previously with The Australian. The week after, newsroom media analysis. What's making the news and why doesn't the arts get in there on a political basis? And that week we're joined by George Megalogenis, journalist, political commentator and author, and as many of you will know, uh, one of Australia's leading political explainers. He just puts things in such a clear context. How to be a media spokesperson. This is a tricky one. It's one I really want to focus a lot of you on as artists. Um, are we tired of never seeing visual arts in the media? Let's work out why and change that. Uh, and we're going to hear from Abdul Abdullah uh, and Jane Mori, um, who late last year joined forces to defend Abdul's work from political attack. And then uh, Q&A with a politician, uh, Adam Bant, also co-chair of the Parliamentary Friendship Group for Arts and Culture. Um, and let's wrap up on that. Um, and speaking of wrapping up, that is what it's time for us to do right now. It has been so fantastic to get to have this conversation workshop with everyone. Please uh, download and, and use uh, the toolkit so that in the coming weeks, as we lead closer and closer to Arts Day on the Hill, there is going to be specific homework and actions for us to get in touch with MPs, report back uh, to everyone, let us know who you've spoken to and what the outcome has been. I see that there's a couple more comments there on the on the chat, which I'll let everyone have a look at. Um, thank you all very, very much. Thank you again to Helen, who has been captioning for us in Brisbane. Uh, thank you to Leah Reid, our Advocacy and Communications Manager, and the entire NAVA team. Big thank you to Maria Van Bakunu for joining us this evening. And thank you to all of you for another great discussion. We'll see you next week with Michaela Boland of the ABC, looking at what journalists are looking for when they're preparing a story for the arts. Good night, everyone, and see you next week. <laughs>